Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Moyer, author of Win Again, speaker, career coach, and business advisor. And I help athletes, executives, and entrepreneurs reach their fullest potential. What you're going to be hearing in every single episode are conversations with athletes and other sports-related influencers. And we'll be offering you the insight that you need to succeed in life, including advice that will let you jump past your competition, whether it be for a great new job or taking your business to a much, much higher level. Make sure to connect with me on social media at Mark Moyer Coach and go to my website, markmoyer.com, to get access to the tips and strategies that my coaching clients get directly. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com and I'll get you going right away. Thanks for joining me today. It's going to be an awesome episode. Now, are you ready to make your mark? Let's do this. Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm broadcasting to you live from New York City and I'm super thrilled to have you on board wherever you're listening. If it's here in New York, anywhere else in the United States or on this great planet, thanks for being here. And I just wrapped up a great conversation with the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, Jeff Idelson. And, uh, you know, it was really great to be able to nail him down for this because he's got so many great stories and insight about not just how he grew up uh, with loving baseball and the pure pureness of the sport, but becoming the president uh, and being there for, for really a long time. It's a great story, a great interview, a, a really great episode. Make sure you check it out. But before you do, make sure you click anywhere on your screen on the subscribe button, whether you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, um, wherever you're listening to YouTube, anywhere, just subscribe. You're going to love all these episodes. Uh, there's so much content on my website, markmoyer.com. You can have access to previous episodes. There's all kinds of stuff about how to take your business and your career to a whole new level. Um, just tons of great content. Make sure you check it out. Also, feel free to email me anytime, mark at markmoyer.com. would love to hear from you, any of your comments or suggestions about the podcast or future guests. But without any further delay, you're going to love this episode with Jeff Idelson. Happy listening. Having her cool beans on, huh? <laughs> Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. My name is Mark Moyer, and I'm super thrilled to have on board today Jeff Idelson, who is the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And you know what? Uh, as a huge baseball fan myself, I couldn't have snagged a better guy. So, Jeff, say hello. Hey, hello, Mark. Good to be with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much. So uh, what we're going to cover today, and, and the reason I'm pretty excited to have you on board, is that this is a very, uh, uh, in my opinion anyway, a great uh, class of inductees this year. Um, you know, Jeff has spent almost just about 20 years uh, at the Hall, including the last 11 years as president. And uh, I think he's got some news to share with the listeners as well going forward. But jumping right in, Jeff, I guess what I'd love to hear from you is, uh, number one, um, you know, where are you originally from? Where'd you grow up? And and uh, you know where you went to high school and were you involved in sports yourself? Yeah, no, I grew up in the Boston area, uh, Jamaica Plain, and then out to the suburbs a little west of Boston. And uh, uh, had a great upbringing there. One of three kids, and baseball was introduced to me really early in life. Mark, um, I just gravitated to it uh, with the help of my parents and grandparents. They took me to my first game at Fenway when I was I don't know about five. And I still have fond, really vivid memories of the first time, as most of us do, walking into a major league stadium and doubleheader with the Orioles. Um, wow. I don't remember a whole lot other than Brooks Robinson made a couple of plays that had me wondering who he was, <laughs> as opposed to, well, you know, who anybody on the Red Sox were. Uh, but that just sort of seeded my love. My, like I said, my parents and grandparents both loved the game. And I went on to play Little League, like most kids uh, my age did in the, you know, early 70s. Uh, I listened to every game on radio. I, my dad would bring me home those, like, legal, those long legal yellow pads, eight and a half by 14. I'd make my own scorecards and listen to games and score games. And that was really hit what seeded things early for me. I loved baseball. Um, I loved being around the ballpark as a Little Leaguer as a kid. And you know, realized my talent was good enough to get me to about age 12. And then like most people kind of fizzled and that wasn't that great. And I just, you know, made it a point to stay involved in the game, however I could by following it. And uh, it's always been a passion. Well, and, and it's interesting because as you say, a lot of kids fizzle at 12. And my, my wife was actually asking me the other day, she said, you know, why didn't you keep playing in high school? And I said, well, um, you know, maybe my fastball was not so fast, you know? So, uh, um, it's, it's cool, but you're right. I mean, that the whole love for the game is, is, uh, and especially with, I think our generation, because we grew up sort of before 
before ESPN, before all the big networks, we sort of had four or five channels to choose from. And invariably, at least in my case, growing up in the New York City area, I, was, I grew up in Connecticut, but in, down in Fairfield County, we kind of had the Mets and the Yanks on, on sort of uh, broadcast TV, and that was sort of it. But you grew up watching that or listening on the radio. And um, I don't want to say it was more pure back then. I don't know what the right term is, really, but it was... Uh, I could see how we all got so uh, nicely immersed. But anyway, so I, I know that, uh, you know, we talked when we met briefly uh, sort of a month or so ago about college and so forth. But tell us where you ended up landing, uh, where you went to school and um, what got you sort of while you were at school, how you ended up landing a job, uh, you know, with the Red Sox. Well, you know, um like you, it was kind of like uh, I went to I went to a massive high school. In fact, there were more high school, more kids in my high school that live in Cooperstown. <laughs> when you, wow. Like when you live and when you live and go to high school in a division that has, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jim Jim Corsi who ended up pitching for the A's, Doug Flutie who ended up in the NFL, yeah. Patrick Ewing who ended up in the NBA. You know, a five ten guy like me wasn't going anywhere in any sport. Uh, so I had to figure out other ways. My best friend growing up, uh, Larry had a connection at Fenway uh, with the vending scenario there, Harry M. Stevens Company, which was yeah. one of the early pioneers of vending. So Larry ended up get, helping get me a job at Fenway with him, and we commute all the time and together, uh, my best friend growing up on the subway into Fenway. And so middle school, high school, and even in college, I vended at Fenway and just loved being around the ballpark. I mean, for me, being around the ballpark was better than any other temp job I could find in Boston. And so I'm graduating, I went to Connecticut College in New London, um, and I'm getting, you know, going into my senior year, and uh, I go to career counseling, as was required back in the mid-80s, and, you know, they said, well, what are you going to do with your life? You're, you know, you're an, you're an economics major with a concentration in international economics, you want to go back to school, you want to teach, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I, I love baseball. I said, well, why don't you try and look for a job on baseball? So I wrote a letter to the Red Sox, um, to their PR department, and I um, yeah, I got fortunate enough to be interviewed for an internship. Um, didn't even really know what PR was, Mark. I thought it was a chance to go to Puerto Rico and, you know, learn Spanish. <laughs> or, That's or great. Just, That's classic. They're like, you know, players. I mean, but when you go to a small liberal arts school, and this is before sports marketing majors and all this stuff, I'm like, oh, PR, public relations, of course, you know. Anyway, so I quickly learned, and uh, I applied for an internship, was lucky enough to get it. I graduated May 25th. 1986 and started with Boston June 1, 1986 in their PR department as an intern and that got me off and rolling. That's amazing. Well, you know, it's funny and I I, uh, I completely agree with the whole concept that back when we were in college, because we're the same year, we're the same age and um, when I was, I went to Colgate, uh, sort of a similar type small liberal arts college and the um, and our career sort of center was the same thing where we had, you know, three or four companies that came up and interviewed and otherwise we didn't have the internet, we didn't have anything. So, I didn't know about other jobs that were out there at all. And I, you know, I ended up actually spending a couple summers on the Cape, uh, you know, working in Mildred's Chowder House as a, as a cook in the back and whatever. And I thought that oh, was an awesome career. My parents were like, what the hell are you doing, man? You got a Colgate degree. I was also an econ major. And I, uh, but that, that, as you know, it coincided with the stock crash back in 87. And right. you know, there wasn't a lot going on in finance, but I, you landed in the right spot. Good for you. So, so you spent a few years, years with the Red Sox and then, and then you know doing some radio doing some other stuff but then how did how do you make that transition i see you made a transition to the yankees i mean that's like um, i mean were your friends and your family completely mortified i mean what are you doing going to the dark side yeah it's kind of like changing political parties i think yeah. at some point in your life that kind of thing but no i uh, i had i was working in boston i was intern in 86 they didn't have anything for me full time so i produced their uh, home radio broadcast with ken coleman and joe castiglione in 87 and 88 Wow. And uh, I just loved, I wanted nothing more than to be at the ballpark. And actually, I went into finance for a little bit and was working for a company to wholesale mutual funds and variable annuities during the crash. And I'm like, this is just, none of this is for me. I don't belong in an office. I belong in a ballpark. Right. And uh, I desperately wanted to work full time in baseball. And I was willing to go to any of the, at that point in 1980, in 87, 88, there were 24 teams, not uh, 30 as there are today. Right. And my goal was to go to any of the, 22 other teams other than the Red Sox and other than the Yankees because I grew up absolutely hating the Yankees. I mean, that's what you do when you grow up in New England or, or in Boston. You know, your parents are, you will be a Red Sox fan, you know, that kind of thing. You're in Connecticut, you have choice. There's more democracy probably in Connecticut. Uh, but anyway, so I, you know, I really wanted to work in baseball and um, uh, I actually was going to be um, 
considered for a job with the American League, which fell through, unfortunately, uh, uh, by no doing of my own. Uh, but then the Yankee assistant job opened up and the Orioles assistant job opened up in PR. I applied for both. Another guy uh, with more experience than I had who had been with the Tigers also applied for both. And so what it came down to was he was going to get his pick of either job and whichever job he didn't take, I was hopefully going to end up getting. And I was really, really hoping I'd go to Baltimore because I love that city. And I said I went to New York. And it ended up being probably the best thing that possibly could have happened for me. Start to realize that you don't um, like a team, you like a sport. Uh, yeah, my friends, my family wondered what I was doing. Nobody wanted tickets, which was a good thing. Uh, you know, but uh, That's great. I had to explain to people that, look, you know, it's, it's baseball. And the five years I spent in the South Bronx as their uh, director of media relations and promotions and things like that really, uh, really was great. Now, it's funny because when you um, when you talk about going to the Bronx and so forth now, you know, I think people seem to think that, um, you know, working for the Yankees, I think a lot of people watch those Seinfeld episodes. Right. And they think that there's George <laughs> that's like, you know, doing that, that whole thing. Right. But what was it uh, what was it like being with George at the time and how, how much did you end up interacting with him? Quite a bit. I mean, because, uh, you know, uh, I was a liaison between him and uh, him as ownership the player as a front office, that was, you know, a lot of my job was being a conduit. Right. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I remember I, I got this job in like December of 88. I go to a kickoff, kickoff cocktail party before the team's going to spring training in 89. I'm, yeah, I'm 24 years old and I, and he's there. So I walk right up to him and uh, I say, Hey, Mr. Steinbrenner, I just wanted to introduce myself to you. You know, I'm your new, I'm Jeff Idelson. I'm your new assistant PR director. He puts his hands on my shoulders, like, you know, good to have you you're the young man from Detroit, aren't you? I said, no, sir. I'm the young man from Boston. He says, it's great to have you aboard. I have three words of advice for you, young man. I said, what's that, sir? He said, Brent, don't buy. I said, oh, okay. I'm on, you know, you sage advice from your new boss, you know, glad to have you aboard. But, you know, working for him was incredibly rewarding. Very difficult guy to work for. A guy who was focused on winning, focused on putting together a product. We were terrible when I was there, but I learned such a good, such a a great amount from him about uh, uh, just being ahead of the curve, how to anticipate, uh, how to manage relationships. And uh, it was tough love, but it was, it was perfect for me at that age. Oh, that's great. And you know, it's funny because um, I think I remember back then when you made that transition, uh, they were comparing your, your departure from Boston and arriving in New York to the babe, I think, right. We were saying, oh my God, <laughs> here's, you know, they, they, I think the Yankees got you for a hundred thousand dollars too, and then they didn't have to. Is that never mind? You don't need to go <laughs> and a ticket to my bye bye birdie. Right. That's right, exactly. <laughs> anyway, but that's that's really cool. So what what so how did that transition then happen from you were with the Yankees for five years? I mean, what made you decide? Well, that was kind of enough, or you'd run your course there, or was it? You know, what was that transition like? Yeah, it was, no, going to the Yankees was great, and being there as the head PR guy was incredible. Uh, getting to work with a great group of players, understand the intricacies, be a very, very close friends that are still close friends now, you know, 25 years later. But I just, uh, you know, when you when you work for the boss, you're 24-7. And when you're right. 24-7, you're 24-7, which meant I was on every road trip. I'd go Valentine's Day, you know, until November without a day off, which I didn't mind because I love being there. But at some point, that becomes a little becomes exhausting. And I, uh, at that point, was uh, deciding I wanted to change my lifestyle, uh, try to do something different. So I left the Yankees mid-93. I went to the World Cup. Um, one of the great uh, uh, things I got to do for World Cup, the soccer tournament that was here in 94, was uh, build their website, which was a dial-up bulletin board system at the time. He talked about the internet not existing when we were in college. And at that point, it was an intranet. So it was a, I connected all nine venues, did all the content, got ground level on understanding what the internet was. And I really wanted to try something bigger and more international than just baseball. And that's what World Cup was. I went from credentialing, you know, 20 TV crews and 200 media for opening day Yankee Stadium to being part of a group that credentialed 7,000 media from 191 countries with live television 24-7 for a month. And uh, it was great learning experience for me. I didn't know anything about soccer, but I learned a lot about world culture. I learned about how to build the Internet a little bit. And it was great uh, training ground for me to uh, at that point in my, in my career. Wow, that's amazing. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with, um, uh, you know, that, uh, when you say it's a training ground and so forth, but, but what, it, what, what ended up, you know what, uh, what enabled it to launch forward to, um, 
I mean, to, geez, the Hall of Fame. I mean, how'd you stumble, in, not stumble into that, but how'd you end up landing there? Yeah, no, I'm at World Cup and just sort of uh, was missing baseball because at that point, again, I'm only 29. And, uh, but I'm like, God, I really miss baseball. I'd love to get back involved at some level. I just don't want to be in New York. I don't know that I want to be on the spot all the time. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Hall of Fame called. Uh, Bill Guilfoyle, who was the PR guy here and had been here for a while, called and said, hey, we're looking to, you know, build our PR staff and your name, name keeps coming up. Uh, would you have any interest in coming to Cooperstown? And I had never been here, uh, believe it or not, as a baseball fan. When you grow up, when you grow up in Boston, you tend to go north and south. I think we talked about that. But uh, when you were up in Cooperstown, Mark, but when you grow up in Boston, you either go skiing in the mountains or you go to the Cape, and uh, you just don't go west. It's just you don't, and uh, especially back then. But I came up here and was like, oh my goodness, this is just like New England. Yeah. I can do this for a year. Newly married, I'm like, this will be a great way to launch a new career. And, 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 uh, that's why I ended up coming up. And then I came, uh, so I, so I got offered the job in, uh, early June of 90 of 94. And I decided on my 30th birthday as I'm alone in Dallas working at the world cup for my 30th birthday present, I'm going to accept this job. And so June 22nd, 1994, I officially accepted a job at the hall of fame. And my first day was, uh, induction day uh, in August with Bill Rizzuto, Steve Carlton and uh, Leo DeRocher. Oh, cool. So what, what did you start doing with them? Like, what was your function initially and, and sort of how did it grow from there? Yeah, hired as the PR guy and we were a staff of maybe 40 back then. Now we're a staff of nearly 100 and we wow. did 200 in the summertime. A much, much smaller operation. And at that point, it was like an open canvas because I was like the new guy with all the new ideas. I was the I was the baby, what, what, what the millennials are today, I was the baby boomer. You know, I was the, the guy that came in with all the funny ideas. But uh, you know, putting the call of fame on the internet, you know, early on getting us started getting, you know, I remember when I asked my boss, I wanted to interview. I'm like, how do I get there? He's like, well, you go to Albany and go left. I'm like, okay, that's not really going to work for actual visitors. So, you know, just, to, I just really started by trying to get the message out. Um, I created media notes, which I did with the ball club, which didn't exist up here. And I, we had three fax machines and I would be on all three of them on Saturdays, hitting up as much media as I could find. And I just looked at ways that I could amplify the museum's message and find people to help me amplify the message. Well, that, and it's interesting you say that because I think people now can't even imagine that back, you know, this is just going back 20 years, right, ish or so, or even 15, you know, that that, that just, that stuff wasn't around. You know, I, every once in a while, I think to, you know, I, I look at my kids and I, I imagine how, what they've been, you know, what they've been accustomed to and what they've grown up with. And it really blows our minds. And it's funny because when we were their age and, you know, our parents didn't have, like they barely had TV or whatever it was, right? And, and now it's just everything, everything is at the, you know, at one, one, uh, you know, one click away, one everything away now. And, but it's really interesting that you mentioned that you really were part of that whole movement to get everything sort of online with the Hall of Fame. And I mean, right now, obviously the site's incredible and it's got so much, so much on there. Uh, which is wonderful, but you know, it wasn't easy to get to that point, I'm assuming. No, it's a slow build. I mean, we started by, you know, we started by, it's very funny. We started by, uh, you guys know, putting directions up. Like I said, it's like go to Albany and take a left. I'm like, oh my goodness. So, you know, I put in directions like actual, then I worked with a company in Washington. It's not like we were like doing this. It's not like I was now where you have open source and you can just basically build your own website. This is like mailing or faxing to a company in Washington. Like it, how to get here from Cleveland, how to get here from Albany, how to get here from really? Boston, New York City, the scenic route, the direct route. I just, you know, you're trying to build, you know, you're trying to build cultural tourism. And it started out as simple as that. And I remember uh, having a conversation with a guy named Seymour Siwak. Seymour founded the Elias Sports Bureau and he still wow. runs it. He's about 98 now, I think. Wow. Great guy, but definitely you want to talk about from a different era. He calls me on a Saturday morning. My phone rings at like seven in the seven o'clock and I'm at home and I'm like, why is my phone ringing? I don't work for a team anymore. He's like, Jeff yeah, Seymour. I'm like, Hey Seymour, how are you? He says, uh, this isn't remember again, this is 1994. So the internet isn't even, the internet's just being born. And he says, uh, uh, you know, I've donated every day by day for every player in the history of baseball to your library. I said, it's great. It's a big, these big ledger books, Mark, where it's the statistics for every guy, you know, it's before wow. you have computerization. And I said, yeah. And I said, yeah. He said, I understand you're going to put that stuff on the internet. And I'm like, at this point, again, I'm putting directions on the internet. You know, the last thing I'm doing is building <laughs> databases that don't even exist. 
I said, Seymour, I said, that's, that's the furthest thing from my mind. All I'm trying to do is drive people to Cooperstown. He says, good. He says, the internet, it's a fad. It's like a hula hoop. It's going to be gone in a few years. I said, <laughs> and it was. No, wait. Um, no. Um, <laughs> now, rule, now rules the world. No kidding. It really does. And so you're, you're, at what point were you thinking, wait a minute, I could have a chance at being the big cheese here? you know, El Presidente. I mean, how did that, how did that come about? Yeah, no, I never thought that. And I mean, I, I basically, uh, it was the PR director, got promoted in nine, 1999 to VP of um, communications and education and basically all the non-revenue uh, consumer marketing, any, any way you promote the museum and market the museum without dollars changing hands. And then we had another guy that oversaw the for-profit side and we had a curator and uh, I was just uh, very, very happy doing what I was doing uh, right up uh, till 2008 when uh, my boss ended up leaving and uh, our chairman, Jane Clark, asked me if I had any interest in being in, in a, you know, applying for the job of president. And I, I just looked at her and I said, I've never, honestly, never thought about it. I don't know that I'm really qual qualified for this. And she said, oh, you know, I and the board think you are qualified so you know would you have any interest in applying i said i, I need to think about it she said well come on think about it and thought about it and realized well you know if the chairman of the hall of fame is telling me this they could either bring in someone who i'm not going to get along with and or may get rid of me or may or maybe i am qualified so i said you know what it's time to jump off the uh time to jump off the dock and put my name in and that was uh, april 15th 2008 when i got named wow you know. and you know that's I'm sure that was sort of a, a uh, what do you call it, like a pinching moment. You pinched your skin going like, oh, how, you know, I was just a fan of the game and now I'm, I'm running this, this incredible entity. And, you know, it's funny because, and I, and I talk about this with a lot of the people that I work with, a lot of the athletes and the executives and so forth, that a lot of times when you're sort of in something, you don't really take a step back and look from the outside and saying, Wow, you know what? I've actually accomplished a lot, and I'm I'm doing. I mean, I'm doing pretty well here. It's it's okay. You know, it's, sometimes it's okay to do that sort of thing. And I think that when you're, I mean, you've been on the inside at the hall for so long that I think sometimes it's hard in this sort of look view of things from like you know, the person that's randomly in Boston or Philly or wherever they are, and they're thinking, Wow, this guy runs the show there. That's really cool. It's such a. Uh, and I'm not saying this to. Um, you know, suck up to you, whatever it is. It's a beautiful hall. I mean, there's so much there. Um, although I'm bitter about one thing, Jeff, and that was that when I was there a few weeks ago, you had, didn't have the baseball card stuff up yet. And uh, that's my that's my mojo. You know, that's my stuff. So I was all fired up to see the, uh, you know, the, the Mickey, the 52 mantle or whatever it would be that would be up there. But uh, I know that's there shortly, or it is now, or just about, right? This weekend, Mark, you're just going to have to come back. All right, I can do that. Can you find me a... Um, I need a room at the Otisaga. Can you line that up for me? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can make a call. <laughs> that's the spirit. I like that. Um, well, this is, actually, it's a big weekend coming up, isn't it? Uh, you got the the legends and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a big weekend. Uh, it's Hall of Fame Classic weekend. Been on the calendar for uh, 10 years now, I guess, since we had the Hall of Fame game for 50, 60, almost 60 years, and that went away. That featured two major league teams, went away in 2008. So now we have an old-timers game, old-timers, where – you take one recently retired player from each of the 30 ball clubs and six Hall of Famers who manage and coach and do a game at Double Bay Fields. So we have that Saturday. Uh, we're opening up Shoebox Treasures, our new exhibit on the history of baseball cards. That opens up Friday. And uh, we have a golf fundraiser with the Hall of Famers Sunday. So this is a big, big signature weekend for us in Cooperstown and the start of summer. It is. And, you know, it's funny that when you get these, these, these guys from the 30 teams together, you know – on, on one level, it's like the all-star game where they kind of think, oh, this is a fun exhibition and we'll just goof around. But on the other hand, they still, they're still competitors. You know, they don't, you know, oh, don't yeah, want no, to strike it, out, you know. <laughs> it never goes away. Those competitive juices stay no matter how old they are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. So you've got an amazing class this year. You've got, in fact, uh, for those of you watching, I'll hold up. I've got the, uh, the, uh, this year's, uh, I mean, the, the yearbook, um, some, some incredible players. But what I found to be really interesting is that, and, and I think you can probably concur, that for a while there was reluctance by the, the voting members to really bring in any designated hitters, any DHs. Uh, I think they thought, well, it's not pure. It's, you know, they, they don't field. But this year you've got two, two uh, biggies. I mean, Harold Baines and, and Edgar. I mean, got it. 
even though I'm a Yankees fan and so forth. I mean, Edgar killed us, uh, but he was uh, such a great hitter. And it's great to see these guys getting in. But tell, give me your view real quickly on, on you've got uh, six amazing baseball players coming in. Just give me your overall, uh, you know, your thoughts on these guys. Well, every, every class has its own, like, it's interesting. Every class kind of has its own look and feel, and you're right. This is a, an interesting year in that you're seeing some of the um, astigmatisms that have affected voting for the last 20 years change, because it's not only DHs you get relief pitchers. Uh, for right. years, you didn't have relief. You had you know, Hoyt Wilhelm, and then you added Raleigh Fingers, and then it was years before you had a Dennis Eckersley and Bruce Suter and Bruce Gossage, and now this year you get two in Mariano Rivera and Lee Smith, two guys who – had different kinds of workloads, but two guys who were at the back end of your bullpen that got the job done. You got two DHs, as you mentioned, Harold Baines and Edgar Martinez. And then, of course, you've got uh, uh, you've got Roy Halliday and Mike Messina, two front rotation guy pitchers that uh, both stood the uh, test of time and, and ate up innings. And so you get six guys, two starters, two closers, two DHs that, from a geographic standpoint, a, fan, uh, a fandom standpoint, is big for Cooperstown. Um, you know, you start with, uh, you know, you start with Mike Messina, who's got New York and Baltimore for markets. Halliday has got Philadelphia, Toronto, dry, all driving distance. Mariano Rivera is all New York. You got both sides of Chicago with Baines and Lee Smith, and then Seattle with Edgar, and they turned out big for Junior when he went in at 16. So when you look at the totality of the class, how much they relate to fans, and fans love to come out and support the players that were good to them. They just want it's a chance for them to say thank you back. The ones that uh, really got along. So this has the, the makings of being, I'd say, in our top two or three uh, induction crowds of all time. As you know from being up here, Mark, we're a town of 1,800, tiny, yeah. little tiny town. There's no reason we can't have 70, 75,000 induction weekend if the weather behaves. Oh, I thought you were expecting 4.8 million. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's going to seem like that, I think. You know, it's funny because when we were up, it was just literally the Otisaga just opened up for the season the night we, we came uh, for, for anyway, for non-conference people. It was very quiet there and we're walking down the street and, you know, it's kind of one of those things where the black cat crosses the street. There's some random little tumbleweed going by and we're like wow this is awesome in a way because we knew that in three or four weeks it would just be you know madness but it's so you know it's such a a, a fun little town um and it's uh but the people are genuinely nice and there's such a, a love for the game it's really um what's kind of cool it's almost like as if um you were in uh, willy wonka's uh you know chocolate factory or something where everything is baseball and I mean, I, I've been since, you know, minute one. I, I mean, similar paths, except I didn't go Red Sox and so forth and, and vending. I wish I had, though, you know, in retrospect. But I was I was too far away. I lived, you know, 50 miles from the stadium. So I, that wasn't going to happen. But, but I, you know, we both grew up. I'm sure you're, you're like me where we memorized all the statistics on the back of the baseball cards. And, uh, you know, I'd always get the, you know, 26 like Rogelio Moretz or whatever it was and uh, and and never a you know a Yankee or something but um, now in terms of um, the I mean I'm not we don't need to get into any sort of big discussion about sort of the controversy around some of the PED stuff and all these guys that are teed up but who knows and all that sort of thing but you know I I guess maybe and I don't know if you're the person that goes on the record doesn't go on the record on any of this stuff but I'm just curious, do you think that at some point there'll be some flexibility with some of these guys, or do you think that it's just going to be a open and shut? Hard to say. You know, this, as, as, as the world changes and as uh, what becomes important in our lives change, it's hard to say what will ever happen. You know, Pete Rose is a good example. Um, when I came in in 94, the big topic was Pete, who in 91 had been banned by baseball. And, you know, arguably one of the top – one, two, three, four hitters of five hitters of all time, average hits, obviously, all of those things. And here you have a Hall of Fame uh, without the all-time hits leader. But, you know, the Hall of Fame's rules for election don't consider players who are on baseball's ineligible list, which uh, Pete was and still is today. And um, my point being is that, you know, he did, he, he did nothing to show he belonged. Because you walked into every clubhouse, <clears throat> as I did, the first rule you saw is I won't gamble on baseball. And Pete admitted to gambling on baseball. But where I'm going with this, Mark, is that now you have legalized gambling in baseball. You have casinos involved at a tangential level. Uh, yet I don't see his candidacy changing. Right. I don't know what will happen with steroids. I think uh, it's hard to know. But, but again, um, 
any player who's under that suspicion of, uh, or a cloud of steroids, um, you know, there's no fact, there's no proofs. With some guys, there is proof. Our rules for election don't ban players who took steroids, but they do uh, uh, ask voters to consider character, integrity, and sportsmanship as it relates to the game on the field. And you could easily, and uh, you know, you, I argue every day that having steroids involved in baseball doesn't create a level playing field that isn't fair. And that those who, uh, you know, took steroids are, um, you know, certainly don't uh, uphold the character clause. But again, who knows in 10, 20, 30 years how voters will think and how the world will think. That's, that's a great answer. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, that, that whole character thing, uh, you know, it's funny because there's some, some guys that, you know, they may not have taken steroids, but there may be all other, other, other elements of their character that it's, it's just not great. And whether we do or don't know about it, it's, uh, it, that's a hard, I mean, that's just, a, it's a challenge that the hall faces every year with, uh, with voting guys in is just, you know, what, where does that line get drawn? So it's a, it's a tough gig. So, are there any, um, from a fan standpoint, Jeff, what kind of changes would you like to see in the game? Or do you, are you ha completely happy the way it is? What, what would you do to, just personally, you know? Well, I think Commissioner Manfred and his staff really do have a pulse on, uh, on trying to make sure the game remains relevant to, uh, you know, to the younger generations than, than me. Yeah. And, it's challenging. I mean, it's challenging because you get a, you have a, a sport that's tried and true with its tradition. Uh, we don't like to change things very often, and the game is is a game of beauty. Uh, but you also have, you know, as we talked about growing up, we wondered why we love baseball so much. Well, the reality too is that we didn't have a lot of choices, and kids today and adults today have all kinds of choices, and that's where you see, you know, maybe the interest in baseball waning or. You go to a game and it's part of what you want to be doing. I mean, you can't do one thing. A lot of the younger generation have trouble just doing one thing and older generation. And so you're starting to see that, I think, not only in baseball, but every walk of life with the tolerance with what we allow and don't allow. You know, you're starting to see clubs. There's probably three, four or five ball clubs now, Mark, that have taken their outfield bleachers and turned them into like in, like in Denver. It's a bunch of microbreweries and for 12, 13, 14 bucks, you're a college student, you come in and you get a general admission ticket and a beer coupon. And there's a segment of society that's happy just being there, not necessarily watching the game. So it's, you know, um, in terms of ingratiating yourselves, uh, accepting that you can do two things at once is one part of it. The game on the field is the other part. And uh, right now it's all about power. It's all about the moment, whether you're a pitcher or a hitter, it's to strike out, it's the home run. And, it's the, and, and those become the moments and the important part of the game. Um, I think that's part of baseball trying to look at popularity and where it goes, uh, I don't know. But what, what, what you can still safely say is there's more than 70 million people going to major league games, still more than 43 million people going to minor league games, so the game remains popular. Well, and you know what's interesting, Jeff, is that oftentimes we, we think that the game is waning, but keep in mind, and you know this, that back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, there, there were plenty of games that were, you know, 4,000 fans, 6,000 fans. There's just uh, for the different teams, the attendance was far lower. And I think a lot of times people don't see that when you see the final game in 61, when Maris hit his uh, record breaking home run. I mean, you know, today that place would be jam packed with people wanting to see that. Like when Jeter had his 3,000th or whatever. But back then, I think it was 26,000 fans were there or some, some small amount. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's really surprising. So I think the, the sport itself is super healthy. I think it's just a question of, you know, the average age is, is climbing at the, at the games and so forth. But you're right. I've also noticed that other teams, what they're doing is they're implementing these ticketing strategies that they'll say, we'll look for 96 bucks a month. You can go to as many home games as you want and sit, you know, right. standing room only, that sort of thing, just to get you there. Because I think some of these teams are also aware that if I go into Yankee Stadium or any stadium, I'm consuming the game, but I'm also going to consume probably a few, couple of beers, a couple of hot dogs. I mean, I'm spending some serious money there, and that empty seat's not making any money. So I, I think it's clever that some of these teams are getting that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that in my perspective, the game of baseball is still what, – what makes it so unique is the fact – and we know we all know this, but there's no time clock. There's no anything that's that's limiting it. And I think there's there's a lot of appeal still to that as much as – on the flip side, there are certainly uh, the younger generation that needs to be constantly stimulated. They're looking at their phone. They're looking at this. They're looking at that. But as long as they're still at the baseball game overall, I think that's what makes it what makes it nice. Um, now, in terms of 
what's tell me a little bit about what's for you next what's what's going on with you jeff yeah well you know as uh you you know i announced my retirement mark and i'll be uh, finishing up this summer 25 years is a nice nice stay in cooperstown and uh the gentleman who's replacing me i couldn't be happier we got him tim mead from the angels pro one of my all-time favorite people the last 30 years who will take this place to the next level which is good which is great for me to feel like for me, I'm, I, I've like spent my 33 years in baseball promoting major league teams, the history, the history makers, and the connection to American history here at the Hall of Fame. I want to give back. So I'm at a point now where I'm going to, I formed a program called Grassroots Baseball with uh, a partner uh, who wants to give back like I do. And it's about celebrating and promoting and elevating the amateur game, the grassroots level of the game. And so, uh, you know, we're going to, we've already begun a little bit actually. Uh, with some equipment drops uh, with Boys and Curls Clubs and uh, uh, in different parts of Illinois. Uh, the first the first, uh, the first, first foray for grassroots baseball is Route 66. So we're actually going to oh, Chicago cool. to Santa Monica over six months and uh, documenting the game as it relates to American Americana, which is Route 66, doing equipment drops all along the way with uh, uh, places where uh, equipment could be a benefit, where you might get kids interested, you might get a few that want to play. And uh, at the end of the day, we'll uh, produce a book, which will come out next year on grassroots baseball on Route 66. Oh, that's that's really cool. You know, a good friend of mine, she was one of the first guests on my podcast. Her name is Marnie Schneider. And Marnie, um, her father, I'm sorry, her, her grandfather owned the Philadelphia Eagles, but she's a huge baseball fan. And she's got a charity very similar called Keep On Playing, where she's actually collaborating with the Boys and Girls Clubs, but she's trying to go into some of the, we'll say the tougher neighborhoods where the kids, their options are sort of not not great or maybe get them on the field and playing baseball. And uh, you know, I should introduce you guys because she's fabulous and she's got so much energy for this and so much passion, as you said, about the grassroots, about, about really, you know, once, you know, one of the things she said, which I thought was so interesting, was she said one of the, and I don't know if this is the right term, but sexiest sounds ever. One of the greatest sounds ever is the crack of a bat. When, when, a, when somebody hits it and crushes it and you hear that it's such a cool sound. And she said, she was saying, when you hear that sound, everybody turns and looks and they want to see what just happened. And, and that's what can really bring people in. And she said, when you get two kids or, or an adult and a child throwing a ball, just playing catch, I mean, is there any greater sort of Americana in my mind than, than playing catch with your dad, your mom, your sister, whatever, brother, et cetera. So I, I think that, I think it's great what you're doing. I mean, I'm thrilled to hear that because you know, the more people that can get involved with that stuff, it's just going to help the game throughout. So, you know, congratulations on that. So shifting gears a little bit, I do this little segment. I mean, I know we've got a couple minutes left. I want to just talk. It's a, it's called hit your mark. And it's just a okay. quick little bunch of quick, fast questions. I think it'll be super easy, for, but I'm curious to know who is, who was your very first, um, who was the first player that you said, man, I want to be this guy. First guy that I felt like that, there were a couple of them because it's hard to remember, but Rick Burleson, I can remember I'm a Boston guy, I'm sorry, but I was, for me it was Rick Burleson and it was Fred Lynn. And they were two guys that played great defense and I was all about defense because I could not hit. <laughs> so <laughs> I liked those guys and I loved how Fred Lynn crashed into the center field wall all the time and took home runs away. So, sorry, you wanted quick answers. Fred Lynn, Rick Burleson. And I'm, I'm going to um, make people in my world turn their grave or whatever it is. But I, I actually, even though I, I was not a, a Red Sox uh, liker at all, but I respected uh, Jim Rice's hitting. I mean, I, I was a, a, an underground uh, sort of Rice fan. I, the, the numbers he was putting up just blew me away. And I, um, I was always impressed. Him and Nomar, actually, I was impressed with him. Um, but I mean, very, my original guys, you know, it's funny, real fast, my, my mom uh, would watch baseball games with me and she didn't quite understand the game too much. And what was always funny was back in sort of the mid seventies, back then with the Yankee broadcast, it would put the person's name and then their, their uh, initial of their position afterwards. And she always thought Thurman Munson's name was Munsunk because it was <laughs> Munson dash C. And she was like, who's this Munsunk guy? But anyway, um, that's really cool. Next question is, um, do you own a boat? No. If you did, what would you call it? Oh, boy. Uh, if I owned a boat, I would call it... I don't know what I just see. I, I guess I would call it seaworthy. 
and Man. prayed that it didn't sink. <laughs> you know what's funny? Bad I name. I don't know. That's a good one. You know what's funny? I just thought of something. C worthy. I was thinking the words, the letter C worthy, and which would be like my college uh, grades experience. You know, like is or, Mark C worthy or not? That's pretty funny. Or, out of that, or the, or the letter that came in front of Thurman Lutz's name for captain. There, there you go. Good, good answer. I like that. Uh, last question. Well, two last questions, but a super easy one. Not really. It's, um, but I do like to ask this of all my guests. Who are the three people, alive or dead, you would love to share a meal with tonight, for argument's sake? In any walk of life? Sure, anything. For baseball? Anybody. anybody. Uh, well, Bill Beck. I'm a big disciple of Bill Beck. I'll keep it baseball for the Otherwise, I could be sure. everywhere. <laughs> I'm going to go with Bill Beck. I'm going to go Casey Stengel because I'm a huge Casey Stengel fan. And I'm going to go with uh, Jackie Robinson just because I've spent so much of my life um, examining him that those are three guys I would love to have a meal with. That's a great answer. I've always wondered what it would be like to have a beer with the babe. Like I've, I've always wondered if, if he was really this big outsized persona that everybody else sees, or if he was just like a, maybe more of a regular guy when you just kind of had hung out with him versus this big outsized thing. Who knows? It's probably two or three beers, not a beer. <laughs> Very good point. Oh, you mean for him anyway. Um, and uh, last question is, I, I think what I'd love to hear Jeff is, um, you know, we've talked about the, the 25 years you've spent there and, and all this stuff you've done in baseball. Give me a sense of the legacy you'd love to leave behind for people and, and, and sort of what you've done and, and sort of going forward. Well, my legacy is really the same as the whole staff here. I'm just a part of it. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that, um, that the Hall of Fame has become more accessible, uh, that, that fans who come here feel that it belongs to them or players. And in the community of Cooperstown, that they're uh, you know proud to have the Hall of Fame as an anchor. That it's uh, it's well more than a important an important tourist destination that just brings traffic in. And I believe we've done that. I think we're an important part of the community. I really do know that fans find us to be accessible, and um, I think we have a lot to be proud of as a staff to really allowing those who want the Baseball Hall of Fame to be theirs to be theirs. Uh, well, that's a that's a great answer and a great legacy. Look. I truly appreciate your time today, Jeff. You know, I want to congratulate you and and really thank you for all you've done and given to the game and given to the Hall of Fame. It's a, it's an amazing institution. Uh, it's an amazing museum. And, you know, best of all, I really think it helps really uh, lift up what, how people see the sport of baseball. So thanks so much for your time today. And and uh, thanks for giving your, so much of your time to the sport. Hey, absolutely. My pleasure, Mark. Great being with you. Uh, likewise. Thanks again. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of Make Your Mark Podcast. The goal of the podcast is to help you find ways to make your mark, to succeed in life, and to jump past your competition. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to be the first to hear new episodes. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email, mark at markmoyer.com, and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.